question. Yeah, child care to end. I mean, it's alphabetical, right? To say, <laughs> okay, well, it's 6.05, so I think we should get started. Now, I recognize many of you. There are a few people I don't, so allow me to introduce myself. I'm Ron Mooch. I'm a principal with Morningside Group. And tonight, we're here to talk about this project, our proposed changes to um, 999 Maiden Lane. It's the third phase of the 1140 Broadway project, which we, for marketing purposes, it's, you may know it as Deepman on Broadway. So I'm gonna start out with a brief presentation, and then afterward, we'll do questions and answers. First, just a little bit about Morningside, again, for the people who, who don't know us. I'm joined tonight by my partner, David Strasberg. David is the founder of Morningside. Uh, the company is celebrating its 30th anniversary. And I can say I've had the privilege of being around for 24 of those years. Uh, we're also joined by Caitlin Lair. Back to the room, she's a leasing representative. Beekman, she's extremely good at what she does. We're very fortunate to have her with us. Could you speak up a little louder, please? It's hard for us to go back to here. Okay, I can also, well, okay. if it'll help, you can also move forward a little bit. There's a lot of chairs. But I'm happy to try to talk a little louder as well. We're also joined by Tom Covert. Tom's a principal with Midwestern Consulting. They're the project civil engineer and entitlement and planning consultant. They, they do great work. So the images you see on the screen, this tells the story of Morningside. Um, there are common threads, as you can see in these images. Obviously, you can't, you don't know the details of the project, but you can see that they're mid-rise buildings. You can see that they are urban locations, and hopefully you can see that they are mixed-use buildings. Uh, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is our retail development. Um, this project here in the middle is a project in, it's in the North Shore of, of Illinois. It's called Northbrook is the community. It's um, 350 apartments with 100,000 feet of grocery anchor retail. This project, more people may be familiar with, it's more local, it's in Royal Oak. It's called Skyloft, it's on Main Street in Royal Oak. That project included 70 condominium units and 70,000 feet of retail. The other projects have retail in smaller amounts appropriate for the particular, particular location. Locally, very locally, Ann Arbor, this is the project we first did when we came to town some years back. You may be familiar with it. This is, this is the former Eaton factory at First Street and William Street. This is the condition it was in when we acquired it in 2004. It was used for auto manufacturing use. And we proceeded to transform the property actually winning an award from the Ann Arbor Historic Commission, the Historic District Commission, for our work to balance the needs of new construction with preservation. And tonight's meeting isn't about this project, but it's near and dear to my heart, so if anybody wanted to sort of get granular and learn more about what we accomplished on this project, I'd, I'd love to talk about it. I would also say that this project is pretty well known, suffered from significant groundwater contamination. And we worked and partnered with Eaton, who has an ongoing remedial effort to uh, chemically treat the water and bring down the concentrations. So, the team. So whenever we talk about 1140 Broadway or Beekman or any of the constituent phases of the project, we're always talking about Morningside because we're the sponsor, we're the developer, we're the ones making the presentation, we're leading the effort. But I just want to point out that we don't do it alone. So these are logos of many of the firms that have helped us get to the point where we're at today. Um, everyone from our partners, to our financiers, to our legal representation, to our architects and engineers, um, all of these people have played a critical role in helping us get to this point, and we thank them for their efforts. But across the bottom, I mentioned stakeholders, countless stakeholders throughout the community helping get this project approved. But I believe the community is richly rewarded as a result. Um, also, I, I couldn't begin to list the subcontractors who are in the hundreds and operational vendors in the, the building that's being occupied right now. 
So a whole lot of people have helped us get to this point. The, um, the investment to date in the first two phases of the project, the building that's complete and the building that's nearing completion is $150 million. These people have helped us deploy that. The new phase that we're talking about tonight would add another $60 million to that total for a total investment of $210 million. Just quickly want to get everyone oriented with the site. Um, so we're going to refer to it frequently. So this building here, well, let me start. First of all, there's here's Broadway Street. And here's Main Lane. Here's the North Side Grill. Hospitals uh, over here. So this is the first phase we call 1200 Broadway, and it's complete. This is the second phase, 1100 Broadway. It is under construction. And this is the site we're here to talk about tonight, 999 Main Lane. So again, I don't know how closely everyone, everyone has been watching this project over the years, but I thought it would be instructive to do a quick, maybe fun timeline of some of the, the more signature events that we've experienced over the course of the years. Now, we acquired the property in December of 2016. And a year later, in December of 2017, we were able to obtain our site plan approvals and zoning approvals for 1140 Broadway. A few months later, in May of 2018, we came to market with the 999 condominium. The use that was on the site we're going to talk about changing tonight. In September of 2018, we started construction on that first building, 1200 Broadway. And I used a concrete mixer. I don't know how many people remember, but we had kind of a fun day. Um, December 15th of 2018, we had what we referred to internally as the pour, the concrete pour. Um, we started at 4 o'clock in the morning and we went for we got special permission from the city, 4 in the morning for 12 hours. And we proceeded to pour 2,000 yards of concrete, uh, about 200 uh, concrete trucks. And this was for the foundation for the, um, the parking structure, which I'll point out on a, on a subsequent slide. Uh, the parking structure at the core of 1200 Broadway. That, that parking structure also uh, doubled as the stormwater detention vault. So it was a thick mat we built for the foundation, two to four feet thick. 2019, uh, about a year to the day from when we started marketing the condos, we stopped marketing the condos. We just did not generate sufficient pre-sales. 2019 saw us install, and I use this acronym PRB, and if anybody can read that diagram, I'd be very impressed. It's not really intended for that. It's just meant to just show this is, um, again, happy to talk about this after the meeting. If anyone would like to know more about the environmental media work, Caitlin was passing out the article we received uh, recognition for our, for our efforts. But that PRB is it's a permeable reactive barrier. It's a passive system uh, that treats the groundwater contamination. I take particular pride in having forged and personally led the partnership that cleaned up that groundwater, which benefits every citizen of Ann Arbor, not to mention downstream communities, as the contamination had reached the Huron River. That partnership was Eagle at the state level, City of Ann Arbor, Washtenaw County, and then, uh, aided by SME, our environmental consultant. 2020, we all started out with the pandemic. It affected all of us. It didn't affect us anymore, any less than anyone else. It was brutal for everyone. But we thought we'd, we'd take it one step further. So in August of 2020, we had a uh, little fire go on in the building, many of you may remember. It actually kind of minor as fires go, we kind of jokingly called the barbecue. Um, there wasn't much in the way of flames, but there was a whole lot of water that the fire department used to put those few flames out. And so then we spent a couple months drying out the building and cleaning up soot and whatnot. But more importantly, in 2020, uh, we saw the opening of the path that we constructed along Traver Creek. That's another thing we're particularly proud of. It was our idea. The city embraced it. We created a public access even along the creek. Um, that path is, you know, many of you who have been in this area longer than I have know that a lot of people cut through the shopping center that was there previously. 
on their way as they move toward the hospital or they move toward Fuller Road. Um, in fact, it was so much so that you may remember that when the previous developer who completely failed and tore everything down and left a raised site, um, he left, he also left a fence around the property. And you may recall that that fence was installed right up to the bank of the creek. There was maybe a foot or two of road. And people were so determined to walk through the site that they, they beat a cow path along the fence. I mean, I don't know how people didn't fall in the creek, frankly, but. I so did. You did. <laughs> you lived to tell about it, though. Um, but we were really happy to open up that path. You know, I hope many of you had a chance to use it. It gets tremendous foot traffic. We're really happy to put it in place. It connects Plymouth Parkway Park with property to the east. Also, in December of 2020, December is kind of a good month for us. That's when we had our first occupancy of the first building, 1200 Broadway. 2021 saw a milestone achievement uh, in terms of the environmental remediation. That is when we achieved 99% reduction of the PCE concentrations, vastly outperforming and exceeding all expectations. Fall of 21, September saw commencement of the construction of the building that's, that's being built right now. Spring of 22 saw us uh, receive some recognition from the American Council of Engineering Companies. It's in one of the articles that we handed out recognizing our, um, our team's efforts on remediating that groundwater. In the fall of 22, with Caitlin's help, we started our food truck initiative. And we, were, we had two food trucks in the fall of 22, and we intend on continuing to do this as we move forward. Uh, it's a great amenity for the tenants. It's a great amenity for the neighborhood. Um, we have on-site roads to do it, so we're really excited about continuing to do that going forward. And looking forward a little bit, 2023 is going to see us welcoming the opening of Orange Market. We're very excited that they're part of our project. It's exactly the kind of retail tenant that we want to have. Fabulous amenity for our tenants, tremendous resource for the neighborhood. Um, exactly the kind of thing we want to have in place. And exactly the kind of retail that will lead to more successful retail on other area properties. Also, we look forward to having people move into the building that's under construction. Okay, so now we can talk more specifically about the project at hand. So, I wanted to start with this slide to talk about parking. So, going back to 2017, some of you may recall this, but the, the parking ordinance at that time required, for this particular zoning and use, required one parking space per dwelling unit. And we worked with the Zoning Board of Appeals to reduce that, uh, that ratio to 0 0.9 spaces per unit. We have the benefit now of having operated this first building, 1200 Broadway, for two years, so we get really a scorecard, a grade on what's, what's the real utilization, what is the demand for parking. And what we have found across over two years of leasing is that the real demand here is about 0 0.6 spaces per unit, significantly less than what we've constructed. Now that's important because that's, that's an important piece of allowing us to propose the changes for we will the site that's highlighted yellow. The, the 0 0.6 ratio applied to 208, 254 units and 1,200, 286 units and 1,100, and the additional units we'll talk about in a second here can be accommodated by the deck, which is great. We also have 37 spaces on the site uh, for guests and retail and whatnot, so we feel very comfortable with the parking ratio that, that we're proposing. Okay, so let's talk about the project that is approved in 2017, the condo project, and then we'll talk about the changes we're going to make to the project that we're proposing. So the building you see here, this is 999 in Pennsylvania. So you see it has a square footprint. For anyone who's not an engineer, looking to plan to it, it's like you're looking down from the sky on it. So the entire first floor of this building, and it's a seven-story building, the entire first floor 
is essentially parking a few mechanical rooms and a little bit of access. But it's basically parking with 95 parking spaces. Up above that first floor, on floors two through seven in this white L-shaped tower, there are six floors of condo units, 86 condos. They're large, they average about 1,400 square feet. The area here that's gray, that's as if you're standing on top of that parking, the first floor parking. So if it was an outdoor mm -hmm. amenity area for, for the tennis. Uh, also, some of you may recall that this particular phase of the project sits in the floodplain, which is what Tom's firm, Tom Covert's firm, is helping us work out. So we have to mitigate the storage volumes of, of potential flood water. So the way we accomplished that in this building was to, it's called wet flood proofing. It's a technique we use in Liberty Lost. It's very common, no, nothing novel to with anyway. Um, but it allows basically with a series of louvers around the perimeter of the building, we allow water to enter that parking garage and then flow back out of the parking garage. It just flows by gravity, there are no pumps. The idea being that not only do you, you accommodate the volume of water that wants to be in that area, but also by having louvers, you, you take the hydrostatic pressure off of the walls, you equalize it on both sides. So that, that's all what, what has been approved. Now let's talk about proposed change of the elevator. So I started out talking about parking. So parking that the 95 spaces here will no longer be located here. The parking for this proposed building will be accommodated in the deck as I discussed earlier. What that allows us to do is use the first floor, not for parking, but for residential. We elevate that first floor up above the base flood elevation. And then underneath in the crawl space, we accommodate the flood, the flood proof just flows underneath the building instead of the room first floor. Now, it's important to us, we are trying to honor our commitments in terms of what we got approved, the initial approval of the building. So we are not proposing any change in the height of the building. This proposed building will be the same seven stories. So we're not proposing to increase the floor area, the same number of gross square feet. We're not proposing to change the setbacks and we are not proposing to change the architecture, which we'll get to in the next couple of slides. And we're also not proposing to change the use. I mean, the, the kind of, the, the, the subcategory goes from for sale rental, but it's still residential use. Um, there is um, another factor of what we're doing here, another feature is that in the initial building, and you'll we'll see this in the, in the renderings, this first floor here is essentially a blank wall. We had some landscaping and some architectural elements to try to dress it up, but it's kind of a dead wall. I mean, it's, there's just parking behind it. But with the new plan and the C-shaped orientation, we're able to carve out a courtyard, a very purposeful, thoughtful courtyard. This is not the stick it on the building and see sun you know, for five minutes a day at noon. This is the courtyard that sees sun and also activates main light. So people come by and we'll see renderings. It's a very transparent view into the activity of, of the program. Now in terms of, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't mention the unit count. So I mentioned 86 condos. By making the changes that I talked about and by virtue of the fact that the apartments are necessarily smaller in square footage on average for about half the size, we get the unit count up to around 200, 200 units. Uh, postcards of 210, I'm pretty, fairly certain that number will come in about 10 units or so less. So roughly 200 units is what we'll have to what we'll be proposed in this C-shaped building. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out before I move on, there's a little change in the mass. So whereas before there was a you know one story here and then you had kind of this L-shaped tower, now it's C-shaped, so there's a little more mass that wasn't here that we accomplished by carving up the courtyard and kind of relocating the mass there. Hopefully in the rendering, so we can see what we're trying to accomplish. So this is the approved architecture for the condo building. This is a very particular architectural expression, um, a certain kind of um, architectural rhythm, ornamentation, material palette, color palette. As 
I mentioned before, we're not changing that. So this is the proposed, this is what the proposed architecture will look like. Now if you look at it very closely, we can find subtle differences. The fenestration will be a little different, or one knows necessarily because there's more units. But as you can see, it's, it's just effectively indistinguishable. The same architectural elements were made in place. As I mentioned before, same height, same setbacks, and so forth. And this is the view, incidentally. So this is Main Lane, and this is the short road. We call it, it's called actually Charlotte Lane, is the name of the road. Again, this is a, a different perspective of the building. So this is if you're standing right here at the corner of Nielsen and Maiden Lane and kind of looking into the site. So this is what I was talking about with the, the one story. So the first floor is parking. On top of that, there was some, some amenity space. And then you have this L-shaped tower with the units. And this is where you have kind of that, that blank wall. We did our best to try to activate it, but at the end of the day, it's effectively a blank wall. So this is the proposed architecture. Now, there's one difference that jumps out at you is that in this area here, it's no longer open, there's this tower piece in here. But again, that derived, derived from primarily from taking this, carving out the courtyard, which I'm going to get to in a second. But otherwise, again, the balconies, the masonry, the same materials, same colors, uh, essentially the same architecture. You start to see now Main Lane, you know, have a better view of it, but See, there's an opening here, so you can come into an, an open active space. And this is that open active space. So, we asked our architect to render what that courtyard would look like. It's probably pretty close to what we would propose. This is a main lane right out in front, and you're only a few feet away on the sidewalk. So, you'll notice that. A lot of activity, right? There's places for people to dine, there's people to play people in the pool or the sun deck, lounging, drilling stations, heavy, a lot, lot of activity. And just like in 1200 Broadway, if anyone's walked by the pool, a lot of activity. And it's, and it's a critical element as well. So we talk about wellness and you know, wanting residents to have a place to congregate, a place to just you know, to, to relax, and it's an essential amenity, and it's important for people to have it. And we're really excited that we can do it in a purposeful way, uh, not just sort of tapped out. You'll notice that the fencing, the yeah, concept is very much transparent, it's largely transparent, and people can, can see into it kind of feel the energy. I just have a concluding slide here. So, this is a Google Maps image from 2016. This is what we came into. Uh, orientation, um, obviously that's the site, six acres. The ETE site over here, which is exciting to hear that that might be moving forward now. Hospital. When we came into the site, as I mentioned, when we came into the site, the, um, uh, the site had already been raised from the previous development. So instead of that red line, there's this chain link fence around the site. I just wanted to point out some of the public benefits that we've created. I would argue that they are profound public benefits. Um, first is sustainability, so environmental, what we've done is remarkable. It might be the, the greatest remedial effort that the city's experienced, certainly one of, one of the highest level ones. And the contaminants are already reached in the Round River. We're very proud of having been, been able to, um, to stop that. In addition, we have many other elements. We have charging stations, we have uh, solar, we have obviously just even constructing buildings nowadays, nowadays to comply with the building code. So much of the sustainability agenda is built in, it's codified and just by building a project to make the building sustainable. Not to mention that in general, we're creating density on a brownfield site, so we're leveraging uh, existing infrastructure. Um, density, so we're creating sorely needed density in town after telling you one of the city's 
chief priorities is to increase density, try to uh, try to bring some balance to the supply demand imbalance that exists right now. Um, and not only are we creating density, but again, we're doing it in an urban site, one that is, is very much walkable and has tremendous transit connectivity, which is why we have that, that lower experienced uh, uh, parking ratio. Public infrastructure. So again, yeah, anyone who's walked around the site, you'll know that we constructed a turn lane here from Main Lane at the Plymouth. We've constructed a turn lane from the Broadway to Main Lane. We've constructed a sidewalk, and this is kind of fun, from where Broadway kind of turns back to the intersection, which again, that was a cow path. Um, and it's just great to see people biking on it and walking on it. It's so much use and so much safer. And actually, we did it we were able to preserve a couple trees working with the staff, which is nice. Uh, in addition, there's the path along the creek that we talked about earlier, um, uh, among other things. And, and of course, not last but not least, the complete reconstruction of Broadway Street in the neighborhood all the way down. It will be complete all the way down to the intersection at the end of this phase, including installation of Green Street's detention, which is a city requirement. Next benefit is affordable units. So um, we extensively deliberated and negotiated an agreement with the city, great agreement. Um, the first two buildings are 15 units that we committed to. Uh, we work with the county and the city. So I don't know if any, everyone knows, but although our agreement is with the city of Ann Arbor for the affordable units, the city outsources the administration of the program to Washington County. And we and Caitlin and her, her staff, they they work hand in glove so that we find the tenants that qualify for the right income level that we've set here at 60% of AMI. Um, and I want to mention that um, as part of our proposal, we're voluntarily offering to uh, include this new building in that affordability agreement. So we would increase the count by about another six units. Also, uh, I wanted to mention the mixed use aspect of the project. So we're creating retail space. We talked a little bit about the lunch market, our first tenant that we're excited to have. We're really excited about what's going to happen at this intersection. This is where the retail belongs. This is where you can see it. It's a challenging area in general for retail, frankly, because it's quite circuitous. It's not easy to park. You have to kind of find your way around. It's, in some ways, it's a little more destination, certainly with the retail center that we control. But at this prime corner, it's going to be highly visible. And we're really, we're really excited about that next use. And last but not least, I know dearest in the city's heart, is the increase in property taxes. So to date, when we, with the completion of the current building that's under construction, we will have increased property tax collection 35 times. So from about $100,000 to $3,500,000 approximately. With the addition of the next building, that number is going to get closer to $5 million. So a 50 times increase in property tax revenue for the city, the city and the state and the county insurance for any number of priorities. Okay, so my pres that's it for my presentation. So um, what I'd like to do is start the question and answer portion. So I want to lay out just a couple friendly ground rules here. And I would just ask everybody to please cooperate. So first, everyone who wants to speak tonight is going to get a chance to talk. Whether you're for it or against it, everyone will talk. Um, but what I would ask is that, um, given the time constraints, if we could keep our comments to a maximum of, say, five minutes in most if people have statements they want to make. Again, pro or con, it doesn't matter. And then if, if someone wants to say more than that, or you want to talk about any of these items in greater depth, I'm happy to stay out of the lobby, hotel bar, whatever, chat about these things tonight. I'll stay as late as anybody would like to uh, Two other quick rules. One is just please, when you speak, state your name, your full name. And, and three, if we could just all maintain civility, I would appreciate that. So with that, if anybody want, has something to say, just raise your hand, Phil. You is this a, a session where we can ask questions and you do your best to answer them? Yeah, please. What I'd like to do is, if you have a statement, make it questions, and then when you're finished, then I'll respond to whatever it is. 
you address. I'll make notes as you talk. You want to go first, Phil? Um, sure. Uh, what is Charlotte and Gordon Lane named after? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll answer that. I'll, I'll answer the question. Sure. Uh, you don't have to, but would you be willing to share the occupancy rate of building one? Okay. As neighbors, we have no idea. Okay. Um, why couldn't you put solar arrays covering the entire roofs of building two and three? In the original drawings back in 90 or 17, all the drawings show there were no telephone poles along the street, but we still have telephone poles up and down Broadway. Are there any plans to bury those cables? And just the comment, the, the creek trail is nice, but I was a little disappointed that none of the junk vegetation was cut down so we actually can't see the creek. It's there's a good 20, 30 feet of honeysuckle making the creek invisible. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Scott. I appreciate the question. So um, Charlotte and Gordon Lane are named after David's parents. The uh, occupancy rate, 1200 Broadway, it's essentially full occupancy, and it has been since, since 2021 when we stabilized the building. Your solar question is a good one. I, some, some in the room may remember, but um, solar has been a priority for the city going back you know, a number of years. And in 2017, um, some city council members had suggested we would put more solar in this project and find a way to do it. And we were very close to having a, a way to create the land for it. So um, we came up with an idea of, of creating a rooftop over the parking deck that would create an un unencumbered field, a large field, because that parking deck is 30,000 square feet, where we could install the solar panels. And we had an analysis, we worked, worked with an engineer, we worked with the city, um, and ultimately uh, the, uh, the city decided against Tip investment, the tip investment that would be required for, for partnership on that solar. Um, but we did work with the city at their request to try to come up with a uh, solar approach. We did talk about that back in 2017 approvals. Uh, with regard to the telephone poles, you know, it's just simply a matter of marketing. So when we show renderings, we, we just don't show the poles out the front when we show the perspectives. But um, burying those poles was never part of the, uh, the tip. Never an expense that that was included. So there is no plan to, to bury those. And then your question regarding the junk vegetation, I think that's a great one. So it's just out of my hands. That's one you're going to want to take up with the city. So there's a public access easement now over that land. And I understand your point, Phil. There's honeysuckle and some here the creek. And there's windows into the creek. But you don't walk by and really see it. So if the city were wanting to remove that vegetation if it could be removed um, it's definitely my call. But I understand your point. If you don't, can I respond to your answers? Um, first of all, solar should benefit you. Well, actually, you know what I'd like to so say? This is the thing. So we're already probably five minutes and we have to let everyone talk. So let's let everyone get through and then we can come back. So who would like to speak next? Right, so Good question. Um, I'm, I'm trying to orient myself. If I'm looking into this, if I'm facing into that courtyard, what direction am I facing? Roughly north. Roughly north, okay. Oh, interesting, okay. So it's open to the south? Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, good. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? No. No. Laura? Um, do tenants have to pay for parking? That was one question. Okay. Um, uh, you know, the whole project has been basically approved and you know how I feel about it and there's nothing we can do about it. But what my 
concern is for the neighborhood is about the parking. We st you still only have one building is occupied, and so far the parking hasn't been a problem. But with the other one opening up this summer and this one opening up in a year or two, I'm concerned that your estimate of how much parking you'll need will not be correct and that it will overflow into the neighborhood. And I know that we could do something like residential parking, but that's a problem because most residential parking is about people who come in during the day, and this would be about people who are living there. So I'm not even sure how the city would solve that, but I would resent powerfully if we were required to pay for residential permits when it's not our fault. Um, so those are my two concerns there. And I'd like to know about um, whether your tenants have to pay for the parking. So, Laura, yes, the tenants do pay for the parking. They always have, and they will continue to pay for the parking. Is it part of the rent, or is it an extra? No, it's a la carte. So that way, it's not, so tenants who don't want parking are not obligated to subsidize those who do have parking. Can so I ask how much it is? It varies. So it's, if you have a compact space, it's $160 a month. You have a you have what space? A compact space, a oh. smaller space, and if you have a full-size space, it's 170 so with respect to the concern about parking, I appreciate the concern. Um, I would just say that if we go back to 2017, at that point, there was discussion about lowering the ratio from 1 to 0.9. And there was a lot of similar concern, Laura, I'm sure you expressed it at the time and others, but even that was a concern. And we were reasonably confident, we wouldn't be proposing it otherwise, that that number not only would, would work, but that it would be conservative. Because but the key to the parking is we have to get it right. If, if we underpark the development, we're in, we're in trouble, right? We're in financial trouble. We can't, people who want to park, they can't live in our building. That means that we're occupying our vacancy would increase, our rents would decrease. It's a real problem. So we have to get the parking right. Now, fortunately, this proposal tonight is not to say, well, the city just eliminated parking minimums, so you know what, it's going to make our development work out, so we're just going to eliminate them, and who really cares what happens. Again, it would be reckless anyway, because if we if we knowingly underparked our, our our development, we'd never get financing, we'd never have investment in it. But the point is, is that we have two years of data of watching, we know our demographic, and we, we know the units we're proposing, and we understand the demand units. We understand it very well. So the point six is there's no conjecture in that. It's real and it's proven over time. Um, I would also add that people do, they have paid for the parking from the start and they will continue to. So if people were wanting to avoid parking in the deck because they had to pay for it, if there was a groundswell of those people, they'd already be in the neighborhood and, and they're not. And frankly, they, they would never park in the neighborhood anyway because the the musical chairs of trying to move your car, it just, just, it just wouldn't work. So what happens is because this site is so close to the medical campus and the north campus where a lot of our tenants come from, so many of these people can say, you know what, I don't want, it's not even a matter of the rental for the, for the parking. They just want the car expense, period. You know, the car payments and the insurance and everything else. Um, so we just have a lot of tenants that just don't bring cars and they prefer to walk. Next. Well, the, you said uh, the condos were going to be 1,400 square feet. And did I hear it right? You said that the apartments are going to be half. Does that mean they're going to be 700 square feet? And isn't that tiny? <laughs> Any other points, or is that a there's no point. I'm just curious. No, I'm just are saying, they do, you have be, any, do you have any other questions, or just that? No, that's just that okay. for now. So. The condos, because they're for sale, are necessarily larger. Yeah. The apartments average around 700 square feet. That's the same average we have already in the fully occupied 1200 Broadway building. And those units vary from micro units, which are a little over 400 square feet, to studio units, which are in the five to 600 square foot range, and one bedrooms, which go anywhere from about 600 square feet up to about 800 square feet. So. We just that's that's the that's the kind of demand we have. Like I, I said at the approvals in twenty seventeen, we don't we're not a student housing developer, it's not student housing where it's by the bed. We don't we don't use bed metrics when we evaluate our properties. It's by the unit. And the kind of demographics we have, those are 
singles or couples, not groups of four friends that want to live together with four separate bathrooms. Uh, who's next? Tom? Sure. Uh, a couple questions, and I'd like to read something. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you for the cleanup. We do appreciate that. I'd like to say thank you for our uh, new tenant, the market. And the question on that is that taking up the entire retail square uh, footage, or is there additional retail square footage that uh, is still available there? Uh, maybe you can eliminate the, the amounts if there's more than one tenant, and if you have another tenant coming. Uh, also a question on, since the site plan is tied to the zoning, uh, do you need to go to city council for your final approvals or just planning commission at this point? And do you, these changes, uh, do you need specific approval to remove the parking uh, as part of that uh, conditional zoning that you have? And then, like to read, please, I may not. So Morningside's final phase should comply with the comprehensive plan and current planning initiatives. And that includes additional retail, more sustainable building methods such as electrification and affordable housing. If the parking is to be eliminated entirely, freeing up the first floor, there should be retail in that first floor space, <coughs> which is supported by the comprehensive plan, by our current planning initiatives for walkable neighborhoods, and even by the planned project modification for this building's footprint that reduced its setbacks, which is usually done to activate the <coughs> So in this phase, let there be retail. On-site publicly facing amenities help reduce the need for car trips and thus the need for cars and the justification for less parking and helps reduce vehicle usage for the surrounding neighborhood and thus extending that carbon reduction benefit in an area that has a dearth of retail now. As a supporter of affordable housing, including my backyard, in my backyard, and as a provider of affordable housing for over 25 years, I would like to acknowledge the citizens of Ann Arbor for funding an affordable housing mill with our tax dollars. Some of that money is being used for a planned unit development that was approved to, to provide affordable housing units at the old Y line. I would like to acknowledge other developers in this area for their contributions to affordable housing fund through our PED ordinance, the Garnet under construction now is paying just under $9,000 per unit for a small 10-unit condo development. Broadway Park West has its groundbreaking ceremony in a couple of weeks. Their PUD includes $2 million for the affordable housing fund. And the Vanguard Hotel, formerly called the Glen, also currently under construction, <coughs> is paying a half million dollars to the affordable housing fund for its PUD that was approved less than two months after Morningside's PUD in disguise was approved. I publicly supported all of those developments in my backyard. And I support other PUDs that are building affordable housing units on site, like the one on North Maple, and those paying into the affordable housing fund, like the just announced five quarters, which will pay a few million dollars into the fund. When Morningside's lower town development was being approved, the narrative was that PUDs were not viable. We knew it wasn't true then, and we spoke up. It was obvious that PUDs were indeed viable when the Vanguard was approved as a PUD on the heels of the Lower Town approval. It is painfully obvious now that that narrative was not true. The comprehensive plan for Lower Town site called for a PUD, the existing zoning was PUD, and the exact same site plan that was approved for Lower Town could have been approved as a PUD, but instead it was approved as a convoluted combination of various things that mimic the PUD, but for one thing, the avoidance of 93 units of affordable housing, or just under $9 million for the affordable housing fund. These are all incontrovertible facts. As for sustainability, if we don't build sustainably, we dig ourselves into too deep of a hole with buildings like this to meet our A20 goals. Another nearby development that I supported changed their original plan and went to nearly all electric. If you want to look at another development that didn't meet their comprehensive plan, look at Valhalla, for example. It was four times the density for its comprehensive plan, but the Planning Commission approved it, in large part because of it being built sustainably, sustainably with electrification. Lower Town's density exceeds the zoning category that Valhalla used. How it got that is a longer story. We can't undo the damage from the first two buildings, but we can ask for the third phase to be built right and built sustainably. 
Our neighborhood expected dense mixed use urban village as specified in the comprehensive plan. We welcomed affordable housing in our backyard. Morningside wanted extra density but didn't want the mixed use nor the affordable housing. It got its extra dense residential develop development with only an accessory commercial use of one half of 1%. It has recently been announced that we'll be getting a small market, which is wonderful, and will offset the loss of our former market, Mono, which departed for the developer's sales office. We need the largest private development since Briarwood to step up in its final phase and provide more of what it always should have provided, more mixed use, a more sustainable building, and more affordable housing. Please, I hope you do that. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for your comments, Tom. I addressed the two questions that you had. So the first one about the site plan and zoning, this will be going to City Council. Uh, the second question was about the, um, the specific, oh, I'm sorry, you had, you had three questions. The first question was about the retail. You were asking about square footage. So there is another space, 2,100 <coughs> square feet, that's available for lease. We're in active discussions with these tenants, and we're excited about the prospects there. I can't can't say much there. I can talk about Orange because we have a lease and we're working on drawings, but um, just say we're excited about it. It's the end cap, or it's the outdoor terrace. Uh, it's great space. Um, your third question was about the specific approval for the parking. So the, the city has rezoned all properties in the city with eliminated parking minimums. So the, we don't need a, a zoning change to allow for the reduction in parking. It's allowed because the city rezoned all properties, including ours. But ultimately, a whole suite of changes that we make will go before the city council. So we'll, we'll ultimately be able to find out. Who's next? Don't be shy. Okay. Thank you. Um, what, what is for, your name? For, I'm sorry. What is your oh, name? My, I'm sorry, Mary Underwood? Mary Underwood. Yeah. Mary. Been here before. <laughs> Thank you for another meeting for us. Um, I, I just want to follow up on um, the retail. That I want to thank Orange Market for stepping into the building. I, I'm a regular customer at Plate Sushi, and I uh, really welcome the market. Um, I'm trying to remember the earlier figures when we first started. I mean, retail space was going to be just one percent of the entire you know amount, and I'm hoping you know the overall percent will be considerably more because you can't claim retail and businesses across the street as your own. You know, and, and it, it falls on you to provide it within this, in the structure. And when you say full occupancy, can you remind me how many total units in all the buildings are going to be provided, and how many total affordable units will be there? Just the numbers of that. And if I have any time left, I'd like to give it to Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So, the first question about the retail. So, there's been a talking point. I have to admit, I did a lousy job of countering back in 2017, and now it's just become this sort of misinformation that the retail is only 1%. So I guess if you're judging retail by saying the total square footage of the project, but the last I checked, we don't construct retail on the seventh floor of a building. Retail is at ground level. So that tired talking point, I'm not picking out of the area, I'm just saying there's others, even a certain city council member kept repeating that mantra about a jar with beans and one bean was retail. It was really annoying then and I'm just correcting what I should have done then. So that has to stop. We chose the areas to put the retail based upon where the retail can be successful. There was no point in doing what they did at the George. George failed retail. That's where you build it where there's no contiguous retail, it's it's below grade, it's setbacks, or cumulative century, no signage. There's 20,000 feet, and after years and years and years, they can't rent it. So you either end up giving it away, it sits vacant, or you convert it to apartments. We thoughtfully, and we spoke to a lot of stakeholders, business owners in the area. There was not unanimity on this. There were, there were certain people that, that felt more retail would be appropriate. There were plenty of people that thought the amount of retail we had was, was very much appropriate. We were very thoughtful about this. But for retail to be successful, rule number one is you have to see it. It's got to be an intersection with a lot of cars. So the intersection of Maiden Lane and Broadway and Plymouth is, is a lot of activity. activity there. Two, you have to be able to park. And there's a certain amount of walk-up that you 
that for sure. But a lot of it is people have to be able to park their car. And so that area, while the parking isn't perfect, at least there's parking on Broadway Street and then into the site, so there's a, there's a way to create some parking for it. Um, and ultimately, for retail to be successful, because the idea is retail will proliferate beyond just our site. This is just the beginning. This retail has to be market rate. So just creating excess retail, just because, and I understand there was a shopping center there, and it was a treasured community resource. I don't work for Kroger, you know, their business model changed, retail evolves, they didn't want the neighborhood centers anymore. It's not It's not any slight on Lower Town, they took it out of the Georgetown area, they took it off the uh, you know, South Industrial over there, uh, where Lucky's was. They want their big centers out on Carpenter Road, and Plymouth Road, and that, that's the nature of that business. And once they left, it became very difficult, I believe, for the owners of the center to backfill. As I understand, and I can be corrected, that they tried with the CBS and maybe some other uses, and it just it didn't really work. Um, but it has to be to, to create a lot of retail square footage just to create it. That's what happened at the George. That's a planning exercise where it checks boxes in the textbook, but it's divorced from reality. And then what happens is you get no more of it. And the goal here is if we can do successful retail that's a benefit to the tenants, a benefit to the neighborhood, the terms are economic terms are reasonable, then people say, oh, you know what, I can do that with my property too. And then you start to see more retail grow in the area. And then Mary, your second question, so again, if, the, if it's 210 units, and I believe it'll be a little lower, but it would be 750 units of housing and the retail units would be 21. Uh, anyone else? Please. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I live on Wall Street. Could you tell me your name? My name is Kitty Morlock. Okay, hi. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, um, you were talking about demographics. So the demographics you expect be different than the first phase for the condo units? And if so, Will that affect the need for more parking? What I'm thinking is, well, and, and also are the condo units two bedroom or three bedroom? Kitty, let me just, yeah. I just, I don't want to, I just want one thing. Sure. So there won't be condos anymore, there will be apartments. Oh, I thought you were talking about condominiums. Well, they, they were. Oh, originally. And now we're changing it. The proposes to okay. change it to apartments. And the bedroom, yes. the 1,400 square feet, how many bedrooms? I'm just thinking how many people might be in the unit. Well, they'd be an average of 700 square feet. Oh, I thought you said the condos were 1,400 square feet. So, so they're, they're currently there's approval for a condo project. Oh. And we're going to change the condo project oh, to a rental project. Okay. So exactly. units will be smaller. I have seen the original plan when they were luxury condos. It's okay. Do you expect the demographics to be similar to phase one and two? Well, go ahead, keep going. But in terms of who? What I'm thinking is I've heard it, it, it may be wishful thinking to say that people a lot of people won't have cars. I'm concerned about that. Um, in terms of, I understand that medical students kind of need to have a car by their second or third year, even though the location is so great to go up to the medical school and the hospital, but they need to have auto transportation to go to various clinic sites. So I, you know, I'm concerned along with others that the 95 spaces may not suffice. Depending on the demographic you expect, you expect a similar demographic because you're saying based on what you had, you feel you can predict what's going to be in this area. Yes. So, so the question is, yes, we expect the demographic mix to be the same. We know that based upon again two years of operating data on the first building. We've already begun to release some cables leading that up on the, the second building, and uh, we see what the interest is there as well. So the demographic will continue to be the same groups. There are a, a lot of the tenants are people who go to the medical campus every day. That could be anywhere from a mid-level provider, medical student, resident, attending physician, fellow, research. Any of those people who you know, make their living at the medical campus, and most people, frankly, can just walk. I mean, it's not far, but there's also great transit options. There's the ride, and there's, more importantly, there's the U of M bus as well. Um, as far as you mentioned, you know, wishful thinking about cars and, and residents and needing cars to get older, again, our our representation of those people who live in the medical campus is, is across the board. Not only is it all those different groups within 
the medical community, but different years in school. So we have plenty that are in the upper or third year medical students or um, that are closer to finishing their residency. So we already have those people. And again, we have the real data on what the parking is. So I see. Okay. Who's next? Uh, Dan Adams, 1016 Daniels Street. Hi. Um, you know, I just wanted to come out tonight to express my support and enthusiasm for the change you're proposing. Um, I don't think it's any more complicated than more housing is more housing. Um, taking taking a, a condominium, a smaller number of condominiums that didn't project well in the market and turning them into apartments that we've, a, lar a much larger number of apartments that are gonna meet a larger demand. Um, as somebody who, as a young professional, struggled to find a rental uh, in Ann Arbor, uh, this is right out of law school when I was first practicing. Um, I would have loved to have this kind of option, particularly given that my wife was in nursing school. Um, it didn't happen, right, it didn't exist. Um, so, when I'm thinking about the change you're making, not only is it adding units, um, it's adding them, I think, in a position where young professionals like where I was, right, as an empathy exercise, this would have been phenomenal. Um, and I think what this project has demonstrated for me really is sort of the limitations of PUD, PUDs as a model for attacking our housing prices. Um, the PUD that sat here before your project failed, it was cumbersome and politically challenging to unwind. Um, and uh, we, we've seen that elsewhere throughout the city when, when a PUD needs to be changed or modified when it fails. It's uh, difficult to, to deal with that, right? It takes resources and it takes money and time. Um, and I don't think we have those luxuries. Um, your, your project is contributing, I don't, obviously I haven't seen your financials, but it has to be an enormous amount of money, both in property taxes and in contributions to the city's affordable housing fund through the knowledge. Um, so it's providing housing, it's indirectly providing affordable housing, and in 30 or 40 years, this property is gonna be the affordable housing for some future generation. So this is great. I'm really enthusiastic about this. Thank you for those comments. Yeah. Who's next? Yeah, I'm Jeff Hall, 611 Longshore. Um, I, I've been a supporter uh, since uh, the project was, was uh, announced because I saw the damage that was created by the prior project that failed, and um, I saw the tremendous need for a lot of the service, a lot of the things that, that's been provided by it. I'm also sympathetic with. Uh, I'm in the renewable energy business. I sell geothermal HVAC and solar. So, and, and you and I talked about this. So I'm sympathetic to people wanting more solar and um, the other sustainability factors. Um, uh, I'm not sure people understand that, that losing the city's support for that dome on the parking deck kind of doomed any solar uh, possibilities because well, people don't know that flat rooftops seem like a perfect place for solar, but there's so many protrusions and the space around them, that it's almost impossible to do anything that makes sense. Um, but um, what I do want to say is that I, I think a lot of the barriers that you uh, encountered, uh, people never really understood, and I, maybe I'm wrong about this, but the prior project took a substantial amount of state money, federal money, for Brownfield, and you were, you were given a very, you, you managed to earn a very small amount compared to that, and you were, up with a very large uh, amount of expenses and limitations that uh, I thought your project, I, I actually thought that the, um, this, this section, the, uh, the condo section was going to be problematic. But for people who don't think about it, um, you're competing with every other realtor in town. You have to have a certain market rate that matches other market rates. You have seven stories in a, and other people have seven stories in a basement. And they can use that basement for all the things that they don't, they want to hide away. They want to hide away the meters, the water meters. They want to hide away uh, air handlers and offices for the maintenance staff and maintenance supplies and all that. Um, you weren't allowed to have a basement because of ground floor. And that actually took away most of your first floor, which should be productive. So you actually lost two floors of this building 
in that sense. And, uh, and the whole project had uh, tremendous costs that other developers would have had been able to take substantial amounts of brownfield money that also provided for other amenities. And you, those were already spent for a previous developer. You did not get that. I actually have put telephone poles into the ground, uh, the wires into the ground. It's incredibly expensive. And generally speaking, most of these cities do not have enough space that there are already lots of things there that would make it impossible to do. Um, I, I, I would love to have more affordable housing there. Uh, I, I would love to have more uh, retail, as everybody else did, as it was said. But in general, what, what you've done is taken a space that probably no one else was ever going to develop except for the University of Michigan, giving us exactly what we didn't want or didn't need. And you have met a tremendous amount of the goals I would have looked to see, none of them 100%. But certainly, uh, given us a good-looking project, people were complaining in 2017 about the height. The height is the same height as the seven-story parking strip structure across Maiden Lane. Uh, they were complaining about the traffic and, and the traffic solutions that you came up with. I thought was going to fail. I didn't think your, your roundabout was going to work. I didn't think simply making an extra lane at the, at the turn on the Maiden Lane was going to work for Broadway. I didn't think the extra lane, the lane changes going up Baden Lane to Moore. I didn't think any of that was going to matter. I live at 611 Longshore, 650 feet up the hill from the building. I thought I was going to have a hard time turning left on Broadway up, up Moore Street to Pontiac Trail. I haven't had that problem. I, no, none of those traffic nightmares have happened. And I think most of your solutions were uh, far better, came up far better than I thought they would. So I think you've taken a problem property, which is why it was vacant for 20 years, and I think you've done a fairly substantially uh, uh, beneficial thing to the community. And um, I, I, I'd still like to see, you know, sure, if there's a possibility to get more retail, but what you said is true. And I was part of a group trying to get Walgreens to take over the old Pro or CVS store. And the Walgreens people said, even if they were to put in a, a, a mini Walgreens, they were going to need four to 6,000 more housing units in the area. The Kroger people wanted more than that before they left. And four to 6,000 units in the area aren't even possible. But that's what you need to make retail work. I, uh, I, walk, I walk from my house down at Maiden Lane, down Maiden Lane, or through the property, or along the creek, over to Island Park nearly every day. I see all the people using it. I see everybody, the traffic walking back and forth to the hospital. Uh, uh, I, I talk to the realtors. I know all the realtors in the strip mall. They're all doing better business now. And uh, I think that you've done a very good job at, with a lot of limitations. And I don't think people realize the limitations that kept other developers from coming to even think about the site that you undertook and challenged yourself to do and your architects to do. And you solved a lot of the problems. You didn't solve all the problems because they weren't solvable. Tom has some good points about about, about uh, what we can still do do in the future, but um, I, uh, I, I overall I I, I, uh, I applaud you for what you've done so far. For the limitations that you're given, and again the fact that 20 years no other developer would have had that, and there were a number of them who tried to fit. So that's my that's my over five minutes. Sorry. Uh, you're okay. Thanks, Jim. Uh, who's next? You can't have one Jim without the other. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Coley, 1015. Broadway. Um, so first a comment and then some questions for you. Uh, I think that it's a fool errand for any of us to think about what parking is going to be needed now or in the future. 10 years ago, if you th thought about parking versus how people approach it now, um, who knows what's going to be in 10 years. Uh, however, I do worry that by charging for parking and making a financial disincentive to park in your structure, not necessarily uh, co figuring out what it is that, that um, what people actually will want or actually own. And that all you're doing is that by charging for parking, you can increase it so that your parking lot never gets, you know, always has three empty spaces ready for rent. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily showing the needs of your tenants. Um, and I just worry that 
because once you don't build the parking, you can't come back and build it, that it, it's going to be a done deal. And I know that parking in a structure, building a parking structure, you're talking fifty to $80,000 per space to do those sort of things. And so I understand why you don't want to have to build it if you don't need to. But I would lay odds if you all of a sudden gave it away for free, you'd be more than full just in one building. Um, and along those lines, looking to the future, do you have the ability or you ever think of putting chargers in that parking structure for maybe in 10 years we'll actually have a lot of electric cars that would need it. And that's one of the problems of electric cars is that for renters, there is no place for them to do it conveniently. And what are your plans talking about retail to develop that strip mall that you at least have some sort of mass release on and when are you going to own it? So you can then do whatever crazy things you want to do in that floodplain there. I'm done. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, with, with respect to the, uh, the parking, you mentioned about the charging, and we should address this, maybe on other people's minds as well. So, as I mentioned, we charge for the parking from the beginning, we'll continue to charge for it. We charge a market rate. If, if you're concerned, I understand your concern, but people, our, our, our experience has shown People don't choose to, to park or not park in that deck based upon the rental cost of the parking space. The decision is driven by an overall cost of car ownership. So if, if charging for the parking would drive people away, we have no utilization right now, but we have 0.6. So we're confident that, again, yeah, based upon two years of data and knowing our tenants and the demographics, we are, we are concerned that that is correct. But I appreciate your concerns, and this gets to a larger discussion just in general about other developers using, you know, it's, 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 we have a benefit in that we have a unique situation where we have a first phase with the parking deck sitting there that we can collect real data from. It's a much harder decision when you're starting the project off from scratch. You know, would, would we have guessed it was 0.6 back in 2017? I don't know that we would have. I mean, we, we, we argued for and obtained 0.9, 0.6 might have been a stretch. You might have thought, you know what, that's maybe that's not conservative enough. We feel like that's not feel. Now we know. Uh, with respect to the EV chargers, Jim, we already have them, and uh, they're scalable. So, as a landlord, as there is demand for EV chargers, I can assure you they will continue to proliferate throughout the garage. And with respect to the retail strip mall, it is not tonight's topic of discussion. <laughs> not your main. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I think sure. the, about the parking, the, the young you people. Uh, I'm Stay sorry, I, I'm, I'm Tom Sukin, and I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't live in Lower Town, but uh, we own the place, so that's why we are here. Uh, I think the younger generations these days own less and less cars. So my, my guess is that in, in 10 years from now, the ratio will be like a less than 0.6 per unit. Right? So I think that the parking will not, parking demand will not increase, I think it will actually decrease in the future. But that, that's just, just my Sure, I appreciate the comment. Uh, you already spoke. Um, Somebody who hasn't spoken yet. Kirk. Hi, uh, Kirk Westfall, 3505 Charter Place. Um, first, I guess, having nothing to do with the future uh, uses, I'm, I'm just really happy that your, your current building is Fully, fully leased up, and it's it's obviously meeting a a housing demand that's um, uh, urgent in the city. And every every one of the people who are living in there aren't displacing or raising the rents of somebody currently living in in the region. So I think I think that's fantastic. Um, that it's taking the pressure off the the rental market. Um, uh, the second, I'm I'm glad that you're pivoting to to rental um, and recognizing the, that, that market uh, demand. Um, and, it, and it's great that you're not looking to add more parking in my, in my view. I, it, it feels like yesterday, um, sitting on the ZBA, uh, you know, have, uh, begging at a very contentious meeting to reduce the parking by 10%. It sounds like it <laughs> that, was, that was pretty conservative. So um, I'm glad in retrospect that this, it can serve the, the future buildings now without needing to add parking because whether somebody rents it or not, adding parking increases the rents for everybody. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that 
the future units can be a little bit more affordable because you're not having to dedicate more space to parking. Um, I, I, and I, I like that the additional density will make future retail in the area more viable. Um, I think every retail owner wants more foot traffic, more rooftops near them, as we heard, you know, might have played a role in why, you know, the Kroger and others um, had, to, had to leave. So I, more foot traffic, the better. And it's just, it's just, it's shocking to me that such a low proportion of people here um, want to own cars and that they're willing to walk and bike and car share and take the bus um, to the largest employer in the county right up the street. So I think mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's surprising and, and encouraging. Um, and lastly, I guess my only disappointment is, uh, as, as the other gentleman uh, referred to, is that <laughs> the height of this building barely uh, touches the height of uh, the U of M housing um, for cars across the street. Um, so I, I just, is there any potential to uh, go for more units? I mean, this is clearly away from the, um, I don't know, it's right up to the street and it's right next to the U of M parking structure. So I'm, I'm just wondering if there's a possibility you can get more height and more units in this location since there's such high demand. Is that your That's it. Okay. So um, there's, we have no intent, we're, we're not asking for any more height. We're, we're working to honor the commitment we made through the conditional zoning to limit the building to the seven stories. To to increase it beyond that, we'd be asking for an additional aspect of the zoning change. And we're comfortable with the density that we can get by changing the unit size and the other changes to get it to around 200 that it's operationally efficient. The other thing that becomes problematic is that as these buildings get taller, the seven stories, we're, there's different, there's different structural systems you can use for buildings, and the one we're using is kind of a hybrid between wood frame, which is most, most economical, and steel and concrete, which gets to be expensive, and we use what's called a cold form structural steel. It's metal studs that can bear load. Um, as we start to get above seven stories, that becomes increasingly difficult. You have to add more and more reinforcement quickly to get to the point we just can't do it. So, unless you're going to get really tall, you know, it's, there's a point where just going to like eight or nine stories becomes Is there a uh, Ralph Katz, Ralph, Ralph Katz, 605 Skydale? Okay. Is there a space in here covered or lockable space for bicycles? Um, and as people go more and more to electric bikes, uh, will they have uh, charging? Is that it? So, um, yes, they're very much as. Bicycle parking is something that this is part of, again, um, the transit options and understanding our demographic because our people go to work at the medical campus, a lot of them, a lot of them at the North Campus, not to mention downtown. But, so bike riding is big in Ann Arbor. It's important. We recognize that. So we've already committed. We have it in the first building, the second building, and third. We have a one-to-one -one parking ratio inside the buildings that far surpasses what the code requires because we know that there could be that demand. As far as electric bicycle charging, I can tell you that we, do, we don't have that in the, the bike room currently. But the second that we were to realize there was a demand for it, we would install it. It's like the EV charging for the cars. If the tenants demand it, we will give them that amount. If we don't, then they're going to go somewhere else where they're going to find it. So we're going to make sure they have it in our room. Who's next? Chuck. So my name is Chuck Boltman, and um, I have in the past supported the project, and I wanted to um, echo something that Kirk was just saying. Um, I have publicly stated in planning commission meetings and the like that I thought the uh, area could use more density and more height. Um, and since I'm on record saying that, and Kirk reminded me of that, are you making provisions for the buildings to be able to be taller? So I've talked to you in the past about the concepts of flexibility. People have mentioned retail on the first floor. I've always talked about retail on the first floor, and um, I sat on the Citizens Advisory Committee to the DDA for five years and reminded everyone every time that what we want is walkable streets. And walkable streets, there's a recipe for that. You have a handicap because of some of your first floor requirements and your lack of basements. 
Um, but nevertheless, you and I have talked about the concept of making the first floor flexible, and now I'm thinking, because I've also um, wondered about the concept of, you know, could the tops of those buildings become something other than residential? Maybe the demand is not there now. Maybe the demand would come in the future. What about a restaurant on the eighth floor in the future? If the building's not set up for it, you can't do that. Is it possible to make those kinds of provisions so that you can go up whatever it is, 70, 80 feet, and look out over the city. People find that pleasant. Campus Inn, who was limited by zoning to the height they had, whatever stories I don't recall, came before the Planning Commission and asked for a variance so they could add a story to put a restaurant up there. Well, that can only be done, that can only be done easily if you think about it beforehand. So you're about to build a new building. The other ones are underway. Maybe that's something you can think about, on top of all the other wonderful suggestions that came here. So, so the answer to that question is, so these, the, the structural systems for the building, the foundations, ultimately, are designed to carry the load of the buildings. So they don't have surplus capacity in them for additional vertical construction. I will say that where, where, I, where I start to see this happening, and I think it's, it's kind of exciting, um, municipalities are doing with parking structures where, for example, instead of having a parking ramp, they're making the parking levels flat or they're building extra capacity into the structure um, in the more urban areas. And that, makes, that makes a lot of sense and it's kind of exciting. I, I think our own DDA was talking about doing that. So it, it lends itself more in that application. It's very difficult from a, um, you might say, well, but okay, but you could design this new building and build in the extra capacity, but the issue then becomes, you know, now we're adding extra cost to the building, and these buildings are very costly to build in the first place. We're doing everything we can to try to keep the cost economical. So it's very hard to make those kind of investments for something that may happen down the road. I, it's it's an interesting idea, um, but but it's not something that we can do in this current building. In addition to the fact that it's got this is a separate issue. I'm not giving this as the only reason, but our zoning also allows us seven stories, so that requires a whole separate zoning approval if you want to do that. But no, that's not something we can do. Who's next? What? You already spoke to Laura. Someone hasn't spoken already? Hank? Yeah, hi, I'm Hank Carpenter. I'm here as more of a market participant. Um, I don't live in the area, but I just wanted to say that. Um, I do think there's a real need for housing, and I think it's proven by the, you know, occupancy of the first phase, and just wanted to say, I mean, you know, no project is perfect, but you guys have done a great job so far, and, you know, I, I thank you for what you're doing in the in the area, because I do think it's very much needed, um, and it, you know, speaks to me on a, on a personal level, um, at, at my age, that, you know, this is, this is what, um, you know, our demographic is looking for and needs in order to be able to live in a city like Ann Arbor. So, um, you know, I just wanted to say thank you for what you've done so far. And, um, you know, thank you to, uh, it's an orange market as well. You know, I think that's really exciting. And I think that, you know, ultimately it is going to grow retail even further in that area. So, um, just wanted to say I'm a, I'm a supporter of the project. Hank, if you wouldn't mind, could you tell people your background? You mentioned you're a supporter, but when you make comments about retail and its growth, yeah, so I, you know, like I said, I'm a market participant. I work for a company called CBRE. It's a commercial real estate firm, and um, you know, specifically, we focus on multifamily in the state of Michigan. Um, we're very active in the Ann Arbor market. Um, you know, familiar with what the the goals are of the city, and you know, the needs of the city, and I think that this project fits it. So um, I, I think it's great. Who else? We could do it for the second question, so the hands in the Lord Steve, have his hand in the Lord, and then uh, Steve, go ahead. I'm just going to come back to a couple of things. So one of the things that, that, you know, I think the temptation always exists to think of all the things that you want in a community and try to then pack them into one, one development. And I think that's un, 
un unhealthy sometimes and, and, and limiting in, in what you enjoy doing. Uh, what I see in this with a really significant change in the density of the air, it's a, it's, a, it's a good number of units, is the other things that we'd like to see as a community indirectly get treated by a project like this. That is to say, I mean, you know, Kirk, Kirk said something similar, but this plants the seeds for affordable housing. As this lightens the pressure on other housing, it's very, very hard to make affordable housing in new construction just by the virtue of the cost. Right. I'm a landlord that has a bunch of older houses. It's, this relieves the pressure, the price pressure on my, my product, so it gets relatively less expensive. Uh, so it does, in a, in a non-direct way, facilitate affordable housing. It doesn't have to be in that building. It is still contributing. Secondly, this, a, a similar thing uh, can be said for the retail. It is a nice contribution to the amount of consumer energy you need in this area to make it appealing for a retail space to come here. I've been a part of projects. Uh, I was an early part of Ashland News. We aspirationally developed retail on the first floor, which remained vacant for 20 years. I can tell you, from the first hand experience, you, when you build it, they don't necessarily come. <laughs> you, what you really need to do is build traffic, and that's what this does, is it, is it creates, the, it, it fertilizes the ground that, that needs to, that needs to happen first for there to be a store or, or a restaurant or, or the next thing that comes, or come because of this. So I just have a, a question for a problem that came up that, that has nothing to do with 999 but has to do with 1200. Is that cars think that the footpath is a road and they go down the road and then they discover that they can't go anywhere so they back up onto Broadway and um, back into traffic and it's a real uh, it's a real problem that needs to be solved with a sign or maybe some I don't know what ball ballers or something. Oh. So did, did you have more or was No no that was just a nitpicking thing I wanted oh, yeah, to that, so okay so that's not nitpicking that's probably the question of the night actually. Thank you for <laughs> bringing that up because I have witnessed a couple of people drive on the path. Yeah. I saw one drive actually around onto McKinley's property which was my body and the other one drive back up. I actually sent the city of Ann Arbor an email describing that situation and proposing signage and it's kind of gone into a vacuum. So uh, I need to remind them that it came up again at the meeting tonight. I, I thank you for bringing The last up. guy I saw come out of there came out of there really fast and obviously had no idea where he was going, backed onto my little garden there. So I was pretty pissed about that. There was a, um, my wife and I took a walk from Ann Arbor to, to Depot Town and Ipsy and across numerous public paths. And there are a lot of situations like that where you have potential vehicular access. There's a certain sign that they took a picture of and said, hey, maybe we should put this sign out there and give me permission to do it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press them on it now that you brought it up again. Phil? Um, I wanted to ask what percentage of the parking has lease takers? And the reason I'm asking is buildings two and three are going to approximately triple the number of residents. So it seems to me your parking, your structure should currently have a one-third occupancy rate. Now, I know you've given a lot of thought, and I respect that from the neighbor's point of view. We'd like some evidence that there's going to be adequate parking. So the, um, the 0 0.6 is a rate, so that applies to the units. So if you take that 0 0.6, apply it to the 750 units, which again, I think will be a little bit lower than that, there's enough parking within the deck itself to accommodate that number, plus there's the additional 37 spaces on the site. As far as the evidence goes, again, would you say, Phil? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. What's the occupancy rate of the parking structure? You're talking about? Well, we don't, so we, I guess we're looking at it two different ways. I don't have like I don't have the occupancy percentage number for you. What I what I know is the rate per unit that for the number of spaces. So it's sixty percent because you're throwing around 0 0.6. 0 0.6 per unit. So if okay, I take so 0.6 times half as much parking as would be needed. I'm sorry, Dave. That, that's okay. So I didn't mean to talk about that. No, that's okay. If if the rental population is approximately going to triple, then no, he didn't. Mean, he doesn't mean that. 
simply means that point that they need 0.6 per u per unit, right? Yes. Yeah. So when it's all done, you're going to achieve 0.6. Yeah. The, the, the parking structure has enough for 0.6 per unit for the whole three building. That is just correct. Part. Part. That is correct. But is it plus the plus the surface parking? So we're not cutting it to the bone. There's a nice buffer there, almost a 10 percent buffer on the side, a little less than that. Thank you. So that doesn't mean that it's anyone else? Out. Tom? Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, you haven't spoken yet. Um, yes, I'm Lois Andrews and I own a condo on Broadway. And I'm wondering what size these apartments will be. Will they all be under 800 feet or under? And will they be managed by a um, management company for rent? Is that what they're going to do? Yes, Lois. So the, the, um, the average size of the apartments will be, as explained to Paul, around 700 square feet per unit. That doesn't mean they'll all be 700 square feet. That's just the average. Now, in terms of the unit mix, roughly three quarters of the units will be one bedroom or smaller, and then the other 25 percent will be um, two bedroom. But these are again are not these are not student by the bed units. These are apartments. What is the estimate then to you? I'm sorry. Uh, Has it been no, projected I'm, I'm sorry, yet? I'm sorry, you asked two questions. Man. So the second question was about the management company. Yes. So as Morningside, we self-manage our properties. Okay. We manage 1,200 Broadway ourselves. So you won't be yeah. selling any apartments? The apartments are not for sale. Okay. The apartments are for rent. Tom, you had a question? Or you yeah. want to speak about um, yeah, it won't be a question. <laughs> um, and it has to do with retail, and uh, I want to lead in to say that we all knew Clover was gone. It was other retail that we're talking about, smaller retail. And, uh, you know, there were, from the previous developer, that demolished a lot of businesses. But just as an example, we have Cottage Inn and the Jack's Pizza. So we know that the area could support retail prior to the additional, uh, however many units you have here, over a thousand residents coming in. Um, and we'd like to find a place to put the retail that we know can be supported by the area. So I keep hearing that it'll go, well, this will spur on retail somewhere else in the area. We don't have a lot of room in the area. So my question is, and maybe Jim can pipe in too, holy, oh. where is the other retail going to go that this spurs on if it's not going to go here? And we're not asking for a ton. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so, if you look at the, um, if you think about the area, the other properties that you would say are, are redevelopment potential sites would be the Broadway Auto site, okay, just across the street, and there's the, the north side of the block, um, the uses on it. So, those are two logical candidates where you would see potentially some retail in the future. And that retail, it doesn't have to mean, by the way, that it's tear down and massive development, and it could be repurposing the buildings that are there. Obviously, you already have retail at the north side of Grill, it's viable, so there are the buildings. So those are the those are the other areas um, we can start to see more than we need. So. so if I may, well, that does seem very limited. So again, it's an ask. Can we have more retail in this building? Because it really is limited other places to put retail very close by. Thank you. Sure, I, thank you. And I, so it's a good question. I understand the sincerity of it. It's just that our analysis and our experience says that the retail, for it to be successful, and successful meaning that it's the kind of use that tenants in the neighborhood find valuable, and that the economic support is not subsidized, it needs to have the characteristics I talked about before. And so we located it where we think it can be successful. Even there, frankly, it's a challenge because it's not easily parked. It's a bit circuitous. You have to learn your way around to get in there. Not everybody's going to walk up. So in our estimation, creating retail down main lane farther to the, like the southeast, it just kind of violates our experience with retail. It puts it kind of on an island. Um, so, so the issues are it's, it's, it's kind of it's segregated from the other retail, which is challenging because who's maybe going to walk down there to the parking there isn't conducive to it. There is site parking, but what helps the retail where the market's going to be 
is that Broadway Street has ample parking on it as well. You don't have that on that way. Um, and then also, you just have so much less traffic over there. So when you're at the corner of the intersection of the three streets, you have so many more vehicles, so many more people in there. As you come down the 999 main lane, there's still good traffic. Like obviously, there's traffic to the, to the hospital. But not as much as you're going to have passing through the intersection that we see. And so in our estimation, we just we, we can't see the viability of it. If, and believe me, if we did see the viability of it, it would be there. So sometimes, and I'm not saying you're suggesting this, I appreciate the tenor of your question, Tom, but sometimes it sounds like, from some of the questions we get from people, it's almost like, well, they don't want to do retail. All they want to do is residential. And that, that, that couldn't be farther from the truth. I mean, if, if we could create viable retail, it only makes our property more valuable. Why would we love Orange Market? Because Orange Market is it's an urban market. The tenants will have such great value and help, it'll help with um, you know, attract and create and, and maintain the demand we have for the units. Say, so, oh, I live in a development where I can walk down the elevator, walk a few steps, and I can get milk, or I can get some fresh fruit, or I can get some bananas. To the extent we can put more retail anywhere in the development, um, we would do it if we thought it was viable. There's no, and I, I mentioned on the first slide, I intentionally talked about some of our other developments, 100,000 feet of retail grocery anchor here, 70,000 feet there. This number, if, if it was, if we believed it was viable, Tom, the number could be higher. We, we just, we just don't see it. But we are encouraged by, again, Orange Mart really excited because of the, again, the kind of use of the economics of that deal. Um, they make sense. So, now we may not see eye to eye on this. I understand, I respect your point of view, but that's, that's, that's our who, uh, anyone else want to speak again or speak for the first time? Jim Rand. I, I have a question. Uh, is there any chance you can go back to the city? You know, things have changed since 2017. Any chance of reviving that uh, the canopy over the parking structure? Um, the answer to that is that the, the ship on that is sailed. I mean, the building's constructed. There's, there's no way to do that work now in a fully occupied building. It's, it's, there was a window for it, and we tried very hard to make that ad, as you know. It's all a matter of public record yeah. and from the ground to the authority. We, we worked very hard to try to make that happen, and ultimately the city opted against it. So, who else? Yeah, Jim Rand. Uh, yes, Anyone else? Okay. Well, if anyone else. Um, so, if anyone wants to chat about anything in greater depth, oh, Jim, you have almost got. Well, I just want to comment. Um, I, I, I know, I know uh, other people uh, frequent the same places, but um, I, I, ha I happen to know quite intimately that the cottage in almost all their business before you came was uh, phone business from the hospital and the university. And that's why when the university closed down and the hospital stopped making it possible to order pizza, the cottage had closed for a while. All of the pizza, pizza places stayed open. Uh, I happen to know that their business has gone way up since, uh, since you've been there. As uh, Joe and his wife, well, Joe who passed away and his wife at the, at the, uh, at the, at the Broadway Cafe, have had, I, I, they haven't had much business increase in the evening, but they've had a lot of increase during, during the day. And they weren't doing really great. You and I both know. And, uh, and by, by the way, if anybody, does, if anybody likes Korean food, go to the Broadway Cafe. It's it's very good, and it's less expensive than all the all the other Korean places in town. And uh, and I really thank you guys for doing your restaurant also. So anyway, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there because it's a little misconception. I think. A little color. Are you gonna plug Jim's place next? Hmm? No, <laughs> no, 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 we don't. <laughs> Okay, well, well, listen, we'll, uh, we'll conclude the meeting at this point. Anyone, pro or con, would like to discuss any of these topics or anything I touched on in great depth, I'm happy to hang out and chat with anyone. But thank you all for coming very much. Thank you. Are you there? You don't have to